I'm delighted that you've joined us for this series of prophetic Bible messages focusing on the book of Revelation titled Three Cosmic Messages. These presentations especially underline the prophecies in the book of Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 to 12 called the Three Angels' Messages. We've been studying them. That first angel's message that goes to the ends of the earth says, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. In our last presentation, we looked at the significance of creation. We saw that creation speaks of a God that is all-powerful, all-intelligent, a God of infinite design, a God of careful planning, a God of purpose, and a God that's created us unique and special. In this presentation, we'll continue to probe the depths of the meaning of what it means to worship God as creator. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're thankful that we're not some speck of cosmic dust. We're not some tin can run over by some truck that some guy's kicking down the road. We're not some meaningless object. We're not merely an enlarged protein molecule, part of the animal creation. We thank you that we're created in the image of God as we study the magnificence of creation. Open our eyes to see divine truths in your word. In Christ's name, amen. If we ever needed a place of security, it's indeed today. Come back with me to a battle that was waging in the First World War. The casualties on both sides were high. The shelling was intense. The fire fight had increased all day. American soldiers with their allies were in trenches facing the access powers led by Germany. There, the rival armies faced one another across the trenches. Many that day were killed. The wounded, the dying, the bloody were all around scattered there. When evening came, it was Christmas Eve, 1914. And a young GI Joe was there in one of those trenches. His mind wandered. He began to think about home. He began to think about the Christmas tree with all of its trimmings. He began to think about turkey and mashed potatoes and mixed vegetables and homemade chocolate chip cookies and apple pie. There in the trench that night, in that war, his heart longed for home. Then, surprisingly enough, he heard the familiar sound of a Christmas carol that gladdened the air. As he listened, he recognized the tune, and he recognized that the words were German. He recognized that old familiar carol, Silent Night, Holy Night. He wondered, is this some kind of a ploy? Is this something that the enemy is using to pull us out of the trenches and shoot us down on this Christmas Eve? But then as he looked, he saw those German soldiers coming toward him singing. He, along with other allied forces and American soldiers, got out of the trench. And they met together. And for that one night, that one brief moment in that horrible war, these soldiers were brothers. They were linked together in a common humanity. Acts chapter 17, verse 24 to 26 says, God who made the world and everything in it, he is our almighty creator. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, and he has made from one blood every nation of men and women to dwell on all the face of the earth and he's determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings that night. Those forces, American, German, Allied Access forces, met together 
And there, together, for that one brief moment of time, they were common humanity. That's really what creation does. Creation links us as brothers and sisters. Creation links the nations of this world together. The, the essence of humanity's dignity is a common creation because every human being was fashioned by God. Every human being by God was shaped and made anew. Every human being is unique. They're new. You know, I'm told that when Swiss lace makers make their Swiss lace, at times they take a microscopic slab, a little piece of glass, and they let the snowflakes fall on that glass and then put it under a microscope. And every snowflake is different, so no two pieces of Swiss lace pattern are essentially the same. When God made you, he threw away the pattern. You see, creation elevates us above the animal creation. It, it elevates us above this evolutionary idea. The idea of creation is the idea that establishes our human dignity. In Christ, the creator, every human being has priceless value and God-given dignity. Whether that's the unborn, whether it is a young man who's been hit by an automobile and now is a quadriplegic and sits in a wheelchair, whether it's a young man born of and has Down syndrome, whether it is a older woman, senior citizen with dementia or Alzheimer's that has difficulty communicating and remembering, all humanity, male and female, young and old, rich and poor, wise and unwise, educated and uneducated, all humanity has worth in God's sight because they were created by the living God. Creation also provides us with a true sense of self-worth. A true sense of self-worth is a sense not that we're superior to others, not that we're better than others, not that we lord it over others, but a true sense of self-worth recognizes that we are created by God, we have value in his sight, that he's given us unique abilities, he's given us unique gifts, and these unique abilities, these unique gifts are to be given back in service to others. All humanity created by God, understanding that creation, understanding their worth has that sense of self-worth. So we no longer walk with our heads down, depressed, thinking, oh, poor me. Rather, we walk with our heads up, taking a deep breath with our shoulders back and a smile on our face and a sparkle in our eyes because we know who we are. We are sons and daughters of God created by the king of the universe. We are unique creations. Nobody is exactly like you in the universe. And isn't that a good thing? Because if anybody was like you, their worth and your worth would be diminished by 50%. You know, even identical twins are not identical. Even identical twins have their differences, their uniquenesses. You are created by God when the genes and chromosomes came together to form the unique biological structure of your personality. God threw away the pattern like a master piece painted by Leonardo da Vinci that has incredible worth because it's one of a kind, because it's unique. You are one of a kind. You cannot be produced on a photocopy machine. Nobody can make a photocopy of you. Although somebody may take a picture of you with their digital photograph camera or on their iPhone, that's not you. You are you created by God unique? Once we go down the road of evolution, we wander down a road that dehumanizes human beings. If we truly worship him as the creator, we will value life like he values it, and we will see every human being created in his image. 
That's why evolution is so dehumanizing. Because really, what does evolution say? It says that there is no creator. It says we evolved from the lower forms of life. It says we are here by chance, by randomness. So if I'm merely a genetic accident, if I'm merely an enlarged protein molecule, if I am merely a little more intelligent species than the animals, if that's all I am, then I have very, very little worth. But if I'm created by God, if every human being is created by God, special in God's sight, then I value others as, through the eyes of creation as God values them. Creation provides a moral imperative for living as well. Creation says, the one that made me and created me as an intelligent, rational being holds me responsible for the choices that I make. Now let's pause here. This is why the message of Revelation 14 is so significant. Because in an age of evolution that says really at least two things here at the outset, that says, number one, that we are merely advanced animals. That dehumanizes human beings, and it does not provide any basis for genuine, authentic love toward others. In that philosophy, it is the survival of the fittest, and I simply trample upon others to achieve my goals. There's no moral ethic that's provided. The second thing is that if I'm just an advanced animal and a little more intelligent than the animal, I have no accountability except to myself. Therefore, if there is no accountability except to myself, the idea of making positive moral choices and standing before the judgment bar of God one day if to give account of those choices, that simply goes out the window. So creation provides a moral imperative for living. It indicates that the one who made me, made me responsible. There, the message of Revelation 14, verse 7, to a generation that says they no, have no responsibility except to themselves, that has no moral ethic higher than the own mind. This message of Revelation says, fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of God's judgment has come. In other words, we're responsible for the decisions we make. We are free moral agents. God has given to us conscience. He's given to us reason. He's given to us judgment. And therefore, the choices we make, we will ultimately be held accountable for through all eternity. Those choices will decide our eternal destiny to a generation that says the sum and bonum of life, that is the essence of life, is doing what you want to do. God calls us back. He calls us back to the fact that he created us. He calls us fat back to the fact that he's given us conscience. He calls us back to the fact of making positive moral choices. Since we were created by God with the capacity to make these moral choices, we are responsible for the decisions we make. We're responsible to our creator. We were responsible for the one that made us since he made us and he created us and he created us with minds to make decisions. We are responsible to him for the decisions that we make. For the evolutionist, the highest standard is the human mind. For those who believe in creation, the highest standard is doing God's will as revealed in God's word. For those of us who believe creation, we believe the God that created the world revealed himself in this book called the Bible and that we will be accountable for the decisions we make in the light of the eternal moral principles of the very living word of God. For those of us who believe in creation, we believe that there are two pathways, the wet pathway of life and the pathway of death and that the devil is leading millions down the pathway of eternal destruction by failing to recognize their responsibility to the creator, God. For the evolutionist, you see, death is the end. There's no tomorrow. Creation, though, speaks of a very bright and glorious tomorrow. I spent many years in the former Soviet Union. From 1985 to 1990, I traveled to Hungary, Poland, and Yugoslavia and spent time there 
sharing Christ with audiences that were largely atheistic in their background. When the former Soviet Union fell in 1989, I immediately went to Russia, lectured in Plahana University, lectured as well in the Kremlin, lectured in the Olympic Stadium. Thousands came to our meetings at that point. At one occasion, I was invited to debate, which I didn't choose to do, a communist philosopher. Because the Christian church in the former Soviet Union encouraged me to do that, to put Christianity in the forefront, I agreed. One of the things that I said to him in that debate over national television was this. I said, suppose you have a very close friend. And you've known this family for many, many years. And suppose your friend's wife is in a tragic car accident and is killed instantly. Your friend is in the hospital and you go to him to give him comfort. I want to know what you're going to say. Are you going to say to your friend, well, you know, friend, it's just too bad your wife died at least she's no longer suffering and, well, she's in the grave now and you'll never see her again and worms are going to eat her body and, you know, this is just a mystery we don't understand and soon we're all going to die anyway, so take courage. What, 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 what are you going to say to your friend who's lost his wife? You know, if I have a Christian friend whose wife's been in a car accident, I can go to visit him in the hospital. I can put my arms around him. We can cry together and weep together. And I can say, friend, you know, you and I don't fully understand this. We live in a broken world, a world of good and evil. And I don't have any pat answers, but I know this, that Christ is going to be with you. He says, lo, well, I'm with you always, to the, even to the end of the earth. I can say to him, Christ will give you strength to get through this. And one day, one day beyond all the sickness, suffering, and pain, you can see your wife again. You can live with her through all eternity again. One day there's a better world coming. You see, atheism has no hope for the future. If you accept evolution and you take it to its final end, it does not answer the great questions of life. But if you look at the eyes of Scripture, and through the eyes of Scripture, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says, Nevertheless, what's the nevertheless therefore? Nevertheless, although there's sickness. Nevertheless, although there's suffering. Nevertheless, although there's heartache. Nevertheless, although there's poverty. Nevertheless, although there's sickness and disease. We, according to his promise, his what? His promise. Christ promises do not fail. He does not lie. We look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. In this world, there is sickness. In this world, there is suffering. In this world, there is heartache. But there is a new world coming where righteousness dwells. Christ created this world once. He created it in Edenic splendor, where there was no sickness, suffering, and death. And our Creator will recreate it. That's the message of the book of Revelation, that we're not wandering on some aimless planet, spinning through space. We're not alone, but that Christ is here with us. And one day, there'll be a better world. Evolution offers no hope of eternal life. It simply offers the grave as a dark hole in the ground. Death a long night without a morning. But creation answers the eternal questions of life. Where did I come from? From the hand of a loving God that created me. Why am I here? To reveal his glory. To enjoy the abundance of life he offers. Where am I going? My destiny is eternity. I remember the story of a preacher who was the preacher of Bourbon Street, actually. His name was Bob Harrington. And he would go down to Bourbon Street in New Orleans. He'd open his Bible and uh, he would share Christ with many of the down and out and outcasts there. One time he was preaching and one of those outcasts came and took a bottle of beer and opened it and poured it over his head. And another time he was walking through the Bourbon Street and somebody came up to him and said, Bob, where you might be going, preacher Bob? He said, I'm going to heaven, but I'm just passing through this life, passing down through Bourbon Street, but I'm on my way to heaven. You know, my brother, my sister, friend, creation says this life is not all there is. God created a perfect world. 
and he will recreate it in Edenic splendor as a perfect world once again. We are just passing through this world. Creation unites us to God. The God that created us wants to have fellowship with us. Creation establishes our self-worth. It says we have value in his sight because we were made uniquely. Creation forges ties with all humanity. It says all humanity is made of one family, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Creation inspires us with a confidence that a God that cares, the God that made us has not forgotten us, the God that made us cares for us. Creation links us to God's inexhaustible power, the one that made us, the one that shaped us, the one that fashioned us has this inexhaustible, this incredible power. This is the message of the three angels. This is part of these three cosmic messages that go to the world in this generation. Creation encourages us with the hope of life after death. This is an amazing graphic. It was painted by the artist Nathan Green. He painted this aspect, this part of the picture of the second coming of Christ called the Blessed Hope, and he painted into the picture the angel presenting a little girl back to her parents. The artist, Nathan Green, happened to know this family, and their little one died at a very young age of a strange disease. To encourage them, he painted this picture of an angel presenting her back to her parents. What hope we have. The God that created us has not forgotten us. The God that created us will recreate this world in Edenic splendor. And as the Apostle Paul says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven in that blessed hope with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, husbands and wives united in Christ. Sons and daughters brought back and placed in their mother's arms those that have died in childhood. What a day of rejoicing that will be. God created us. He is all powerful. He is coming again in the clouds of heaven in Christ to redeem us. Now this creation has given to us a sign of that creation. When Christ created the world, he left a perpetual sign of his creative authority called the Sabbath. And every week, the Sabbath reminds us of that God that made us. Every week, the Sabbath reminds us that we are valuable and precious in his sight. Every week, the Sabbath reminds us that he is the God of intelligent design and that he has a purpose for our lives. Every week, the Sabbath reminds us when we go through difficulties and troubles that he has power to change our lives and solve those problems that we face. Every Sabbath, the creation story calls us to the new creation that there is in Christ and that he will make this world over again. That's what this message of Revelation is all about. That's what the first of the three cosmic messages are about. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the what? Everlasting gospel. The gospel is grace and mercy and love to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This is no message that is to be done in a corner. It is to go to the ends of the earth, saying with a what kind of voice? Loud voice, so that the whole world hears, fear God, respect God, live a life of obedience to God, give him glory in everything you do, because we're living what time? The judgment hour. But notice, worship him that made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. In other words, worship the creator. So in an age of evolution, God has sent a special message calling us back to worship the creator. Why do we worship anyway? The revelation of Jesus Christ is a call to worship Jesus as the creator. 
Now, this may be a new thought for you. Who is it that created the world? The Bible says in Genesis 1, God created the heaven. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the Bible also says the Spirit of God moved on the face of the deep. So God is the active agent in creation. He creates through the power of the Holy Spirit, but he designates creative authority to someone. Who is that? Ephesians 3 verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. Now notice this next phrase, who created all things. How many things? All things through Jesus Christ. So God is the master creator, but he designates creative authority to Christ. So Christ is really the active agent in creation, the one who carries out the Father's plans. So Revelation's call to worship the Creator is really a call to worship Jesus. Do you see why Satan hates creation so much? Because for Satan, Jesus is a rival, and he's made every attempt to discredit creation because he hates the Creator. So the devil has attacked creation as a way of attacking Jesus. The devil wants to rob Christ of his creative authority. He wants to rob Christ of the worthiness that Jesus has to be worshipped as our creator. That's why the Sabbath, the symbol of creation, is at the center of the great controversy over Christ's worthiness to receive worship as our creator. As we come and worship on the Sabbath, we say, Jesus, you are worthy to be worshiped as creator. The very basis of all worship is the fact that he created us. Revelation 4 verse 11 says, we read it in our last presentation as well, but we have a little different emphasis this time, you are worthy. You are what? You are worthy. You are what? You are worthy. Why are you worthy, Christ? You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. If you destroy creation, you destroy Christ's glory. You destroy the honor that is due to Christ. You destroy the very power of Christ because he spoke and the worlds came into existence. So this issue of the Sabbath... It's not some issue of legalism. It's not some minor issue of you choose one day and I choose another. It is at the very heart of the great controversy between good and evil. It has to do with Satan's intentional intent to destroy Christ as creator and undermine the very basis of all of worship for Christ. In an age of evolution, God has given the Sabbath as an eternal symbol of his creative power, as an eternal symbol of his authority. In Acts 17, verse 28, we read, in him in Christ, we live and move and have our being. When we come to worship on the Sabbath, we are saying, Lord, in you we live, in you we move, in you we have life. We are acknowledging that Christ indeed is the life giver. The Sabbath also is that link to our family of origin. It reminds us of who we are. It takes us back to our roots. We are anchored in a God that made us at the beginning, not anchored in primeval slime. The, the Sabbath is a link to that family of origin. It reminds us that we are special in his sight that we are precious in his sight, that we are fashioned uniquely in his sight. You know, some time ago, I read a fascinating and a real cute little story. Little Shia was about seven years old. Her mommy had a baby. And mommy and daddy, Shia and her sister, were just a family that loved one another. And Shia kept saying, mommy, can I go into the baby's room and, and talk to the baby by, by herself? Mommy, can I, can I go into the room with the baby? And you know, mother was a little bit hesitant. She wondered what Shia would say to that 
little baby and she wanted to be quite careful. But as the baby grew a little bit and as Shia showed maturity and as she showed a real love for her sister, Shia was allowed to go into the room. Shia went in, closed the door, but that left it open just a little crack. Well, mommy and daddy wanted to know what Shia was going to say to her sister. And so they listened at that door in the crack of the door and they heard Shia say this, baby sister, tell me what God is like because I'm beginning to forget. <laughs> baby sister, tell me what God's like because I'm beginning to forget. In the hectic world of the 21st century, in the frantic pace of the 21st century living, we all tend at times to forget. This world overwhelms us. The responsibilities of life seem to choke out at time the very life of spirituality. At times, the world presses in too close. We tend to forget. We forget that God created us. We forget that we were made special by him. We forget that we are precious in his sight. We forget that he can remake us and recreate us into his image. We forget that he has a better world coming, that there's a new day dawning, that there's a better tomorrow on the horizon. And so he's given us the Sabbath. The Sabbath, this oasis in time. The Sabbath, this palace in time. He invites us to remember, to remember that he created us, that he fashioned us, that he shaped us, that he cares for us, that he died for us, to remember that he's coming again for us. Now, there is a not-so-subtle deception, and that not-so-subtle deception tries to blend evolution with a form of creation. And what it says is this, and some Christians have really bought into this lie. It says, well, you know, maybe God was the first cause of everything, but maybe then he just allowed the world to evolve after he created life initially, then over millions of years, he let the world kind of evolve. So he was really the first cause. He caused that first spark of life. There's what some people think or believe. They try to harmonize creation and evolution. But from a biblical perspective, that's really not possible because the Bible says in Psalm 33, verse six and nine, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. So the Bible teaches that this world came into existence, not over long periods of time, but God spoke the world into existence. So to accept the idea that God created the first spark of life and that then let life evolve is a denial of the scriptural story and undermines the very foundation of scripture. The Bible also says in Hebrews 11 verse three, by faith we understand the worlds were made or framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, there were no long years of evolutionary progress. Rather, God spoke and this world was created in the very, in the very likeness of God's plan. God spoke and the world came into existence. The days of creation, according to scripture, were 24 hour days. Some people say, well, could those days have been thousands and thousands of years? Well, we already read Psalm 33. He spoke and it was done. It doesn't say he spoke and it continued to be done for thousands of years, millions of years. But there is another way that we can know that. If you look at creation and you see the linguistic grammatical structure of Genesis chapter 1, the Hebrew word for day is the word yom. And throughout the Bible, Every time a number precedes the word yom as an adjective, it limits the time period for 24 hours. Now, it is true that sometimes the word yom in the Bible is used for a longer period of time. But when you have a number preceding it as an adjective, it has to be 24 hours. So if you say that the 24-hour days of creation are longer periods of time, that they're not 24 hours, one of the real problems you have is you undermine the very structure, the very grammatical structure of scripture. There's another problem with that. 
In Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11, the Bible says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What sense would it make for God to say, Remember the seventh day Sabbath, if the seventh day Sabbath were not a 24-hour period of time, and if it were merely thousands and thousands of years, each day of creation. So it would be nonsensical to say, remember the Sabbath, six days God created the world, the seventh day rested, if indeed there is no seven-day creation week that are literal days, 24 hours each. So what happens when you begin to revise the scripture and try to make it fit in to what one believes is a more scientific explanation, although I should hastily add that there are many creation scientists who look at the evidence in geology, the evidence in biology, the evidence in the earth, and believe that that evidence indicates the reasons why there was a flood, for example, a universal catastrophe. They believe, these creation scientists, that the evidence of the earth indicates that God did create the world. They see in nature, design. They see in nature, in intricacy. They see in nature a careful planning. But here's the problem with a one who tries to both harmonize the evolutionary data with the biblical data. It means that you undermine Genesis, it means you undermine the Ten Commandments, and it really means you bring into question what Christ himself said. Because Christ talks about creation, he talks about the flood, he says in the beginning God created male and female. So you bring into question the entire realm of scripture if you go down that road. That's why Satan is challenging the very heart of God's authority. He wants to attack the Sabbath because he wants to undermine creation, because he wants to attack Jesus, and he wants to diminish the authority of Christ and take away the very essence of why we worship Christ. The Sabbath is at the very heart of this controversy between good and evil. It's at the very heart of this controversy over worship. Satan claimed that God was unfair and unjust. He claimed that his laws were arbitrary. The ultimate question was one of authority. And the law of God, the commandments of God, are the very basis of the authority of God. And the Sabbath in the heart of God's law is at the very foundation of this battle between good and evil. Obedience to God's commands that flow out of a heart that loves God is extremely important throughout Scripture. It's not something superimposed upon believers. Obedience comes from the heart. Now, somebody asks, well, wasn't the law of God done away with when Christ died on the cross? Jesus says, John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says in the book of Hebrews, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I will write my law in your mind, in our minds so we know it. I'll write my law in your heart, in your heart so you'll love it. So in this controversy between good and evil, we are called to make moral decisions. We're called to obedience in the light of the judgment hour. We are called to worship the creator. And the very essence of that creator worship is worship on the Sabbath. This is a titanic struggle. It's more than a matter of days. It's more than a matter of an arbitrary decree. It's a matter of a battle for the throne of the universe. That's why the message says, Revelation 14, verse seven, fear God, a message as important for our day as Noah's message was for his day. A message of obedience, fearing God, giving glory to him. A message of the judgment hour to make eternal choices. A message to worship the creator. And the very essence of worshiping the creator is found in the creator's day, the Sabbath. But notice, Revelation 14, 7 says, worship the creator. But we go down to the ninth verse. A second angel follows in the eighth verse, talking about the fall of Babylon. We're going to talk about that in our next presentation. But notice, then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, 
says worship the Creator. Revelation chapter 14 verse 9 says don't worship the beast. So you have two worships set distinctly in opposition. Where do these worships find their focal point? Where do they find their climax? The next verse tells us, here is the patience, in other words for patience is endurance of the saints, that's believers. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So Revelation 14 verse 7 says, worship the Creator. Revelation 14 verse 9 says, do not worship the beast. Revelation 14 12 says, that the way we worship the Creator and do not worship the beast is because of the faith of Christ that lives and dwells in our hearts. We thus keep the commandments of God in obedience. Now, my friends, this is not some periphery issue. This matter of keeping God's commandments is not something that is a side issue of Christianity. It's not that I'm saved by grace so I can do as I please. It's I'm saved by grace so I can do as Christ pleases. And once I understand this larger issue, this message that God is sending to all humanity, this message uh, that's a call back to fearing Him, respecting Him, and obeying Him, of giving Him glory in the way we live, this message of the judgment hour that calls us, that compels us, that urges us, that beseeches us to make a choice to give our whole lives to Him. This message calls us back to worshiping the Creator. It calls us from the falsehoods, the traditions, the deceptions of Satan, which he's trying to undermine the very law of God and destroy the Creator's authority because he hates Jesus. These two worships are contrasted in the book of Revelation, and they are contrasted before our very eyes, worshiping the beast or worshiping Jesus Christ on the day that he has created and enshrined. In the future, church and state will one day again unite. In the future, at a time of chaos and calamity, as we shall study, there will be laws passed in an attempt to enforce worship of the beast. But those who worship the Creator will stand firm for Jesus Christ through His grace, by His power, because they love Him and they're saved by His grace. The heart of the Sabbath is relationship. The acknowledgement that God is worthy of our most supreme devotion, that He's worthy of our deepest allegiance, that He's worthy of our total loyalty. What does Sabbath say in a 21st century society? It calls us to devotion. It calls us to the deepest allegiance to Christ. It calls us to loyalty. The Sabbath is a palace in time. And every seventh day, that palace descends from heaven to earth. And Jesus invites us into the glory of his presence. And a Jewish writer by the name of Abraham Heschel really describes the magnificence of the Sabbath in these words. The Sabbath is a metaphor for paradise and a testimony to God's presence. In our prayers, we anticipate a messianic error that will be a Sabbath. And each Shabbat or Sabbath prepares us for that experience. You see what Heschel is saying? That the Sabbath is a metaphor for paradise. So on the Sabbath, the palace in time descends. We leave the cares of earth. We leave the heartaches of earth. We leave the sorrows of earth. We are enclosed. We are shut in with Jesus in his palace. We are in relationship to him in worship. We are in relationship to him as each week we come to sing his praises, as we study his word, as we pray as corporate bodies in worship. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, forsake not the day of yourselves assembling. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, the Sabbath becomes the sign of loyalty to him in the light of a universal conflict between Christ and Satan. And then Heschel says, unless one learns how to relish the taste of the Sabbath, one will be unable to enjoy the taste of eternity in the world to come. The Sabbath is an appetizer. The Sabbath provides for us a taste of eternity. The Sabbath is a time for us to fellowship with our Creator. Heschel goes on, six days a week, we wrestle with the world. 
wringing profit from the earth on the Sabbath, we especially care for the seed of eternity planted in the soul. The world has our hands, but our soul belongs to someone else. You see, the Sabbath is that time to nurture that seed of eternity that God has put in our hearts. And we nurture that as we worship our loving Creator. And that seed grows and blossoms so the fruits of the Spirit can be seen in our very lives. On Sabbath, Christ finished His work. It was complete. And on Sabbath, we rest in His love and care. Sabbath rest is a rest in his loving care. Sabbath rest is a rest in his righteousness, not ours. Sabbath rest is a rest in anticipation of the eternal rest that Christ will give us when he comes again. Sabbath rest is a symbol of a faith experience in Jesus. It is a graphic illustration of our trust in him because it is a total period of rest in Him. We enter into His palace in time. Salvation comes only through Jesus. We cannot earn it. We don't deserve it. But we rest in His love and care. We rest in the fact that He created the world in His finished work of creation. We rest in His finished work on the cross. And as we rest on Sabbath, we say we can add nothing to our salvation. Our works don't add to it. Our works are the response to His grace, the response to His salvation. We come and we say, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. We come resting in the cross, resting in grace, resting in His mercy, resting in His pardon. But there's something else even deeper in the Sabbath. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 says, moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. The Creator God, the all-powerful God, who created this world and rested on the seventh day, the God who spoke and worlds came into existence, He says to us that the Sabbath is a sign of His sanctifying power. The Sabbath is a sign that He can make us over again the Sabbath is a sign of the new creation. Sanctification is a word in the Bible that means holiness. It means one who is set aside. Christ makes us holy. We don't make ourselves holy. We don't change our own lives. We are not our own creators. But as we come on Sabbath, we acknowledge the fact that he is the sanctifying God. We acknowledge the fact that he is the God that touches us with blessing. We acknowledge the fact that he is our all-powerful creator. God wants to set you apart as his special child. He longs to sanctify you as that special child of his. The Sabbath is a symbol of that. The end time message of Revelation is one of worshiping the creator. It's a message of the one who recreates us so he can give us victory over those besetting sins so this all-powerful creator can break the chains that bind us, that can unlock the prison doors that trap us. He can deliver from alcohol. He can deliver from tobacco. He can deliver from those foods that we use to indulge our appetite to destroy our bodies. He can deliver us from hatred and bitterness and anger and resentment. He can deliver us from lust and impurity. He can deliver us from the captivating, alluring attraction of those video programs and those digital media onslaughts that corrupt our mind at times. He is the one that can give us new desires, new tastes, new love. We worship Christ as the creator because we love his creation. You see, worshiping Christ as the creator not only means that he will recreate us, but if I worship him as the creator, I will be interested in caring for his creation. In an era when industrial pollution is destroying our earth, in an era when this earth is being polluted by factories all around us, there is a call, a relevant call, an end time call to worship him as creator. If I worship him as creator, 
I'm going to respect that which he created, the earth, and do everything I can to care for the earth. But also, if I worship him as creator of all that he has created, the human body is the most sacred. So if I worship him as creator, I'm going to care for this body that he made. Sabbath is that call to worship him together as creator, the one who created heaven and earth. It's a call for families to come, to pray together, to study God's word together, to let the power of the creator change their lives. We need Sabbath quality time with God, with our families, who sanctifies us, the God who helps us to keep growing in our spiritual lives. And one day in eternity, one day in a place called glory, one day in a place called heaven, one day when we walk on streets of gold, the Bible says, Isaiah 66, verse 23 and 24, it shall come to pass that one new moon from another and from one Sabbath to another, every month will come up and partake of the tree of life. But every Sabbath, every week, every seventh day, one Sabbath to another, all flesh, how many flesh? All flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. We will have and enter into that forever relationship with him. Can you imagine it? Singing on Sabbath in heaven, worthy, worthy is the Lamb to receive blessing and honor and glory. The Sabbath is not some legalistic requirement. It is a day of rest and gladness. Let joy fill your soul as Charles sings, O day of rest and gladness. day of rest and gladness, O day of joy and light, O balm of care and sadness, most beautiful, most bright, under thee the high and lowly, before the eternal throne. Sing a holy, holy, holy to the eternal one. Thou art a poor protected from storms that around us rise, a garden intersected with streams of paradise. Out a cooling fountain in life's dry, dreary sand. From the Lepisgah's mountain, where you our promised land. O oh, day, your sweet reflection, out a day of love. A day to raise affection from earth to things above. No grace is ever gaining from this our day of rest. We seek the rest remaining to mansions of the The Creator God invites you to enter into His palace. Every Sabbath, God's palace descends from heaven to earth. And you have a personal invitation to fellowship with the Creator. Creation speaks of a God that cares for you. Creation speaks of a God that created you and fashioned you and loved you beyond what you can ever imagine. Creation speaks of this all-powerful God that wants to change your life, that wants to give you a new heart. Creation speaks of a God who rested on the seventh day, and we can rest. Rest from that anxiety. Rest from that worry. Rest from that care. 
we can place our lives in His hands. Creation speaks of a new world, a world where the heartache and sorrow is gone. Creation speaks of a God that is coming again. He created the world once and he longs to recreate it again. O oh, day of rest and gladness, will you enter into the joy of creation by committing your life to worship him each Sabbath and understand the bigness and largeness of the Sabbath as we pray. Father, many of us have understood the Sabbath before, but we see it in bigger terms, larger terms. We accept your invitation to accept this as a day of joy and gladness. Some of us have never heard messages on the Bible Sabbath before, and just now we make that decision to follow you and enter into your joy in Christ's name. Amen. May Jesus guide your life as you understand more fully the blessings that he has for you each week in the Bible Sabbath. My prayer is you enjoy the blessings of the Sabbath today and always.